From the beginnings of the Union to its end, this story is going to be a little bit different. They were in demand. Henry Rathbone was the son of the mayor of Albany, and his father's untimely death when Henry was a teenager left him a fortune. His widowed mother went on to marry a senator, himself a widower with four children of his own. The sort of complicated blending of families and fortunes that kept the powerful powerful back in those days. And from this union came another. Henry Rathbone was introduced to Clara Harris, his pretty new stepsister. They became friends and became more as the Civil War came, right to their doorstep with the Potomac River, the border that separated warring nations just a dozen miles away from Clara's home, just across the park from the White House. When they got engaged right before Henry went to join the fight, and when he returned in one piece, the reunited couple looked ahead to a glorious future. They were young, they were rich, they were in love, they were step-siblings, but I swear it wasn't weird back then. <laughs> and judging from some people's Google history, it's not weird today. And they had all the right friends. In fact, when the Lincolns were looking to go to the theater in April of 1865, that wonderful spring when the war was won and was merely waiting for the final paperwork to clear, when fireworks lit up the sky, when the relieved and the drunk and the giddy poured out of the bars and sang songs in the streets, the first couple thought of Henry and Clara. They weren't at the top of the list, if truth be told, the first choice was obvious. Lincoln wanted Ulysses S. Grant, the man of the hour. Except Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Lincoln never got along. But Mary Todd Lincoln found her neighbor, Clara Harris, positively charming. And Clara's husband cut a dashing figure in his uniform. They were a delightful couple. And what better way to spend a spring evening than with young people in love? Picture the Lincoln assassination. Whatever comes to mind will do. Something, well, I, I suspect an etching you've seen, a painting that you've seen somewhere along the line. Maybe the most pivotal moment in American history depicted again and again the box at Ford's Theater, Lincoln Booth with his mustache and his pistol emerging from the back, the flash from the barrel, maybe the swirl of smoke, maybe the horrified wife. You likely don't remember that there are two other people in the box with them. I forget they're there, though they usually are there. A young man in a uniform, a young woman in a satin dress. So look at them, picture them now. Even if you don't remember these depictions, Lincoln in his chair by the door, Mary is there, and Henry Rathbone still with his war mutton chops on a bench in the back. Clara Harris, his wife beside him in the dress she made for the evening. It felt so good an hour or two before when they walked in with the Lincolns, sat beside them as they basked in the glow of their presence, as the orchestra played Hail to the Chief, as the audience cheered and whooped in honor of the Savior of the Union, and then in the third act as one actor cracked a joke on stage and the audience laughed, gunfire cracked. Right there, it all happened so fast, all was chaos as the actor John Wilkes Booth fired a derringer into the back of the head of Mr. Lincoln, and, and Mrs. Lincoln screamed, and there was a smell of burning gunpowder and burnt hair, and Henry Rathbone, he springs up, it, it, it all happened so fast, and grabbed for Booth and his gun, but didn't see the knife, and cried out and lost hold of the assassin. And as his blade, that blade right there, tore into Clara's husband, opened him from armpit to his elbow, and blood sprayed as Booth pulled away. And Henry grabbed for him, but just caught his clothes. That's why Booth tumbled out of the booth onto the stage and broke his leg, was because of Henry. Um, as the killer, as the man who just shot the president, just shot him like that right then, leaps over the railing and into the crowd, and Henry yells, stop that man, but no one stopped that man. Clara Harris sat with the president's wife in a house across the street from the theater, sat with her friend Mary as the doctors did what they could, but couldn't do enough. Clara's new dress, soaked through with blood, soaked to the petticoats, wet on her skin, and her face and her hands were streaked with blood, and she thought to wipe it off, thought to clean it, but she needed to stay with Mrs. Lincoln. People begged her, please stay with Mrs. Lincoln, who was wailing in her grief and alarm, who would gather herself just for a moment and then see young Clara and scream anew, my husband's blood, my God, my husband's blood. And in the days and months that followed, Henry and Clara were everywhere, Famous for being there that night. Their story sought out. Their images there at the center of it all. But then those images started to fade away. There are no ghosts. And this is not a ghost story. But that doesn't mean it isn't haunted. 
The summer of 1865, hot and strange after Lincoln's murder had snapped spring in two, Clara Harris went to her family's vacation home in New York. She brought the dress that she had worn that night with her. She hadn't cleaned it. It may be that someone told her not to. It's history. It was a relic from a martyr, a man turned into myth even before his body had been laid to the ground. Or it may have been that she simply couldn't, couldn't bear to, to scrub it out or to burn it. Oh, ignore that. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. So she hung it in a closet in the guest bedroom of the house in the woods, and the next spring when she returned to her house upstate to get away from D.C. and the commemorations of Lincoln, to escape the things she would remember when he was remembered, she was sleeping in that guest bedroom on the night of the anniversary, the bloodstained dress still hanging behind that closet door. When she awoke to the sound of laughter, low and resonant, Lincoln's laugh, just as she had heard before the gunshot, Lincoln's ghost, she was sure, but there are no ghosts, but does that matter if you are certain? Her husband too was haunted, though Lincoln never appeared to him, he was haunted. Henry Rathbone never got over that night. At first it seemed normal, I mean, frankly it would. Picture, you and your significant other have just been invited by, pick whichever of your favorite presidents there are, I know it's not that one. Um, <laughs> imagine you've been invited with your partner to sit with them in the private booth and everyone's looking at you and oh, but this is probably the best evening of your life and you've been having one of the greatest evenings, you and your future wife in Washington with Lincoln after Lincoln's great victory and the president is shot in the back of the head beside you. You had been done with the battlefield, made it home alive and suddenly a gunshot? Suddenly a fight? A knife tearing you open, your wife is screaming, stuffing her handkerchief into the hole where your bicep used to be. And the president is bleeding out beside you, and you could have stopped it. And could you have stopped it? Could you have moved more quickly, grabbed for the gun, had pushed the president aside, had taken the bullet yourself, or stopped that man, wrestled him to the ground, took vengeance right then and there, if you had been stronger, if you'd been braver, if you'd been more heroic, had been a better man, had been Henry Rathbone and Clara Harris were married in 1867. They had three children. Those children's father never got over that night. Clara Harris's husband would mumble to himself, I could have been faster, I could have been stronger. It's me, it's all my fault that he's dead. It's all my fault the president's dead. It should have been me, it should have been me. Her husband would have these delusions, would be convinced she was planning to leave him, to take his children away. Her Henry was so haunted by this idea, he would bring it up so often that eventually she wished she could run away. Told her family that she would, she would were it not so afraid that the stain of divorce would haunt her. Instead, she tried to find her husband help. They went off to Europe to see doctors who said they could break him of these thoughts. Instead, it all just broke him. They would return to their parents' home in Albany, where the dress, still bloody, still hung in that closet. There were people who would say they heard Lincoln, too. Disembodied laughter from down the hall. A ghost in the house. Clara Harris became sure of it, and sure he was responsible for her unhappiness and her husband's madness. She had the closet bricked over like Fortunato behind the wall. And then they set sail again across the Atlantic to put distance between them and the ghosts. But Clara's husband was haunted. He was ill, suffering from some psychiatric disorder for which there was no useful name then, no treatment protocol that had been proven effective by some double-blind study, who was delusional, <laughs> who was delusional and paranoid and depressed. And who's to say what else? Before dawn on Christmas Eve in 1883, 18 years after Booth and Lincoln had, uh, after Booth shot Lincoln and then stabbed Henry Rathbone, Henry came into the room where his wife was sleeping and shot her. He then stabbed himself in the chest six times. She died. He lived. He was taken to an asylum where his torments did not end, where he was certain that every night a gas was being pumped into his room, certain that they, whomever they were, were trying to kill him. He lived there for three decades until he died in 1911, having been haunted for almost 50 years. The dress hung in that closet for nearly as long. People in the house said there were ghosts. They heard Lincoln laughing. They saw Clara Harris silent, in her bloody dress, walking down the halls with Lincoln's blood. It wasn't Lincoln's blood. Uh, the way he was shot, the angle, I'll spare you, but it wasn't Lincoln's blood. It was Henry's, but they didn't believe him. And after all, there are no ghosts, but 
They didn't believe that. Henry and Clara's son believed the dress cursed his family, had drained his parents, his own childhood of all happiness, had murdered his mother, had made his father mad. And that haunted them all. The year before his father died, he broke through the brick wall, dragged out the dress, and burned it in a fire. It did not banish the ghosts, for uh, there are no ghosts. But may he have believed that it did. A toast! I would kindly ask everyone, please lift your spirits. <laughs> to your ghosts and all the other things that bedevil you, may they haunt you no longer. By the way, um, quick palate cleanser, if that was a bit too heavy. Read anything about Lincoln, everyone who ever met him said he had a really high-pitched voice like that of a tea kettle. So whenever, every time I read about, she heard his laughter in the house, all I can imagine, ha, 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 gosh! That's all I can imagine. Here we tell you what the history books will not. Woo! All right, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to move to cocktail break in a bit, let you ruminate on what you've learned tonight. Before we go, uh, some of you may know we have a mascot named Harvey. Uh, we track the travels of Harvey and Harvey's companions, and uh, we are building a Harvey map so you can see where in the world Harvey has been. So in the last few weeks since our last salon, Harvey has been to the Smithsonian Castle, uh, tasting some delicious things in Italy, and he met the god Be uh, Barirava, which in Sanskrit means fearful. So he met the, uh, the god of fear. You can pick up your very own Harvey at the merch table. Uh, it, in addition, you can get some stickers, swag, glasses, and also discount, uh, discount tickets to the next salon. So please help support us get some merch. And uh, tonight's themed Harvey is the Harvrachnid Wolperweb Slinger. Thank you, thank you. Yes. I do, I make them. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so you can adopt your own, or you can go to the merch table and enter in our raffle, and we will raffle him off after the break. So uh, grab a drink, grab a buddy. We'll see you in 15.